beautiful visions, tangible visions, with their very eyes. Our honoured interviewee today, our distinguished guest, is Rabbi Avram Romy Kohn. I came to know him a number of years ago when I was working for World Aguda, representing Aguda Sisro World Organization of the United Nations. And I came to know Romy because I had a sphere. He brought me into a project on which he was working. He was working on a project to rebuild and refurbish and revamp completely the oil of the Heilige Chassam Sofas Chisay Dugazulayim. It was in the ground, in a crypt underground, and on top of the area covered by the, uh, in which the cable was found, was a train station and train tracks leading to the station. He persuaded the city council of the city of Bratislava to remove the station and reroute the train tracks. And he persuaded them to agree to a complete rebuilding of the Oyo. I had the sphere to write the agreement for that major, major undertaking. In the course of that program, I saw two things which really speak volumes about the character and the personality of Rabromi Khan. The agreement initially was that the budget would be one million dollars. It eventually ended up more than that. But the initial agreement was for a budget of one million dollars. $700,000 was set aside for moving the train station and rerouting the tracks. And the city of Bratislava was to meet the bill for that. The other $300,000 was involved in the reconstruction from scratch, really, of the oil over the Chassam Sofas Caver. Rebromi called together a meeting in the home of the Matusdorf Rorschlitte and within the space of five minutes he had raised the $300,000 necessary for his committee to put up the oil. I prepared the agreement. He took it to Bratislava. And I think everyone associated with the project expected that the mayor would take this draft agreement in his hand, thank Rebromi and say to him, we'll look at it, we'll read it, we'll study it, we'll show it to our lawyers, and we'll get back to you. And that is in fact exactly how the meeting started. Suffice it to say that when Rebromi walked out of that meeting, he had in his hand a signed copy of the agreement signed by the mayor of the city of Bratislava on behalf of himself and the city council. An extraordinary feat. This is Rebromi Kohn, a much beloved character in this community and much wider. A model who has brought several tens of thousands of children into the bris of Avromovino and whose chesed in supporting Torah, particularly through the Keren of Avram Akoyan, is legendary. Please join me in welcoming and honoring our distinguished guest, Rebromi Akoyan. Okay, my boy. I thought there was a hisp. I'm sorry? <laughs> I thought there was a hisp. <laughs> The Heilige Chassam Sofa, Schisser Yuganalaini, has not been on this earth for over 170 years. And yet you, Rabromi, 
as very much a product of the 20th century, now the 21st century, have such powerful, powerful bonds to this great tzaddik and God will be his throat. How do you explain that? Coming from the city of Tehassam Sofer, it was not only me, every child and every person, Chassoy was living in his soul, not only in his home. And this was every Jewish home in Pressburg. The Soifer was the root and the source of everything there was. Sai Mina, Sai Rishamayim, Sai Havas Abriyas, Havas Hashem. This was inrooted in such a way that this could not be uprooted. How did that manifest itself in daily life in Prejbar? Well, it's, it's known, Pressburg was a city, was a Mokum Teure, one of the biggest yeshivas in Europe. Every stone and every street was full of toilet in Yerushalayim. And above that, there was an absolute mimus. Sincerity. And this was the key to the Yerushalayim. Could we have the next slide, please? What is this building? And this was the big shul, the main shul in Pressburg. Did the robe of the city double there? Officially, the robe doubled in the Shishtim, which was the yeshivas, which was the yeshivas of Samedrish. And the shul, as the robe of the city, of course, there were many rabboni in Pressburg. There were approximately 30, 40 shuls, and each shul had a roof. But the roof, Pressburg roof, which was the grandson of the Chalom Sofer, he was the official roof. And his obligation was, at a certain time, to officiate in the shul, such as the Shreudish Musaf, Yom Neroim, Yom Toivim. And that was the place where he had his droshes. It was part of his obligation as the roof of the city. In the Korn family home in which you grew up, how did the phenomenal Kesha to the Hassam Sofer manifest itself? I would say not any different than all Mishpokas and all the families. Like I said before, this was the source, the root of every person was I'm sorry for this teaching. Could we have the next slide, please? What's this building? And this building shows the Shishtim, which was the Bissamedrish, where the roof was davening, and the, all the Balbatim, the Chachumim. This was the place where the but they don't. Did you learn there? No, I was too young. Too young. In terms of your own practical development, how would you say the influence of the Hassam Sofer impressed itself on your personality and your character? Beside that the Sofer, his spirit was embedded, of course, in my father and mother. And they gave you all that chizuk. They showed you the way of life. And they gave you all the strength and chizuk in having betuch and with all circumstances. 
and that accompanied you during the difficult days of the Shoah and beyond to this day. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you talk about the home in which you grew up, how would you describe or characterize that home? What were the key hallmarks of the home in which you were raised? The key was Torah, Gimnis Hasodim, Hachnos Orchim, Ahavas Hashem, Emunas Hashem, and Ahavas Abrias. You see, the city of Presburg was a city which we were not Hasidim, was today you call it Misnagdim, but this Misnagdim is the wrong word because they didn't oppose anything, just contrary. They wanted, they accepted everything. If it comes from Hasidim or what so called modern orthodoxy, the all the all those fractions there were no difference at all. The same Ahave, the same Ahve, which we had, there was no such thing as distinguish between one person and the other. Ahav's Shem was something which is above everything else. Tell us a little bit about the Haknosis Orchim that took place in your home. My parents were Hashem. They were well-to-do people. And they were wise enough how to use their wealth. We had a big house, which housed our family. But besides that, we had also a wing, which housed the Shiva Bukharam, which gave him board free of charge. We had another wing which housed younger Bukhara from the Shiva Ketan. They got also free board. This was part of our house. So for our meals, regular meals, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, including Friday, there wasn't a meal which was served in the dining room or which had a guest which was welcome. Some of them were widows, more or less people, they had no home. They were steady orphan there, with such called, they called that Stammgast. They stayed with us every single day. And then there was no such meal we shouldn't have invited two Yeshiva Bukharim who were steady with us. They had steady ate every meal with us. And beside that, there was always some kind of Orchim which passed by, which were invited. <coughs> so during the week, we're not talking about Shabbos, just a sim simple meal. We had around five, six people who joined us during our meals. And what about on Shabbosim? Shabbosim, Baruch Hashem, was, was a little different. We had our official dining room, which seated 20 people. We used it on our Shabbos. It was a custom, unfortunately, in Europe. There were many people without Parnosa. And what they had to do is they had to travel to the most western part of the country, where people are more affluent. And they wandered six months a year to just raise some money, to send some money back to the family. They should be able to sustain themselves. Those people, they were traveling, they were neglected. Pesburg was one of the cities which was very well visited. It was considered a city from Chesed and Tzedoke. So in Shul, every Friday night after davening, was a custom that all those guests who wanted to be invited to a barbos, to the meals, there was a corridor, and they lined the corridor both sides. And each Balbos who went home took one or two orphan guests with him to the Shabbos table. My father, Oliver Scholem, he left the shul, the last one, when everyone was gone. Then he left the shul. And unfortunately, there were also certain orphan which were nobody wanted to take home. They were neglected in appearance. They didn't have showers and beds for a long time, so they had an order. And those people, people rejected. My father, Oliver Sholem, 
took all those people who nobody wanted to take home. Those are the people he took home. Sometimes there were too many people and we had only a limited place. So we had special tickets to the restaurant, which was Oldman Shabbat. Those people who couldn't take any more home, we gave them tickets there in order to have a regular Shabbos meal. How did the household help react to these guests coming home every Friday night? Well, unfortunately, like I mentioned before, those people were neglected. And those are those people who nobody wanted to have at the table because for some of these reasons, and not only that they had orders and the behavior was not exactly like we expected to have on the Shabbos table, but some of them, due to traveling and so on, they were infected with insects. And when they're sitting down, the chairs were upholstered. And after they left, the household, household help took those chairs, took them out on the yard, they had to clean them up from the lies which he left behind. So those are the ones only who complained about being those people in the house. My mother, Lord Shulam, never said a word. Years later, your father, Oliver Shulam, felt that the Rabbeinu Shalom repaid him for the particular type of Haplosis Orchim, which you have just described. Can you tell us that story? My father was in Mauthausen for the last, the remaining last few months of the, of the war. And everybody knows Mauthausen was a camp, you know, which very few, very few people survived. And my father tells me he was sitting on the yard and they saw the lice marching down on the floor. When they were sitting there, he saw that those lice was avoiding them, kept on going, and none of them, as many they were, they all avoided him and didn't come close to him. <laughs> so my father said, this is in schools. I took people with lice into my house. <laughs> That's a beautiful story. Tell us then, how would you summarize the key lessons you learned from your parents? The key lesson wasn't a lesson, it was an upbringing. The upbringing was either Shemaim pure issue mind, without any ingredients, without any salt. Have a session, have it. And this was something, the love to Hashem and the faith, the betokhan Hashem. This was so strong that nothing in this world could possibly shake it. You also learned something from the Haknosas Orchim which you applied later on, didn't you? When you, in fact, were instrumental in helping support families in the bitterest of days. It's not easy to talk about those days, not time. It's nice to listen, but when I have to remind myself and speak of those terrible days, it's not easy. We had just this week with Avtoyle Chazoyni Shayoi, and he says, Peitza Chabiro Imako. But the memories which brings, brings me back, talking about those times is not very, not easy. It is not a scar, it's open wounds which are as fresh they were in the time they would happen. And when you talk about it, it just awakens again those memories, and it's very, very painful. After the war, I used to get nightmares. Such a nightmares that in the morning I got up, the sheet was drenched with sweat, 
And the next day and the two days after, I wasn't able to function. So I said to myself, Kishbaruch has saved you from the Nazis. They didn't be able to kill you. Or well, now you're going to kill yourself by letting yourself into those nightmares. You won't be able to exist. So I made a promise to myself. I'll never talk about it. I'll never think about it. And I just wiped it out of my mind. I was approached many times by Yad Vashem, which is the organization, which is the courts, the Holocaust happenings, because they had people give testimony, and my name came as a cross-reference. They were very eager to have an interview with me. I should give them, give them my story. I refused. After many years, again and again, they approached me. I still refused. But the Holocaust deniers came out when they said the Holocaust never happened. So I said to myself, no time to continue that luxury and forget about it, you have to speak up. And that time, I did give him a testimony, a video testimony. They, matter of fact, they made a transcript of this testimony and I published a book, which is I, out of the book, which is called The Youngest Partisan. And this is the book which is, which is published today by Art Scroll. That time, all Jews were gone. In Pressburg, there were no more Jews left, with a few exceptions, where people were able to find a bunker by the Nazis, by the, by the, by the Gentiles who saved them from the Nazis. This was towards the end of the war. We figured, not a couple of weeks, not a month, the Russian front.